Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Al Terrace here, aka the Tradicaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time, we are preview previewing the New York Knicks versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. This will be the last matchup of the series. Currently, the Knicks have a, a lead on the series, 2-1. to one. And with us to break down this game is Chris Fedor. He is a Cavs and NBA reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer. He is also host at 92.3 The Fan. But before we get into this preview, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. And this show is brought to you by KnicksFanTV.com. Chris, my guy, how are you doing today? What's going on, Al? How are you, man? I'm doing all right, man. You know, the Knicks, uh, a surprising season for us, so I'm happy about that. Looks right. like we're, we're, you know, as after beating the Miami Heat last night, we're a walk just to be in the playoffs. Don't have to worry about the play-in. So I'm feeling <laughs> good right now. You know, I'm feeling good right now. But, you know, I know some people, especially if you listen to Stephen A. Smith, it's still doom and, doom and gloom no matter what because we didn't get Donovan Mitchell. And we'll get, yeah. into, we'll get into that conversation. But uh, I'm ready to break this game down, man. Ready to break this game down. And, and first question for you. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the Knicks? Yeah, I mean, the way that they've played since adding Josh Hart when they've been fully healthy, um, it's not surprising to me, but it stands out to me, right? Like, they're a different team with him in the lineup. He was the kind of guy – that they absolutely needed, right? The guy who can do a little bit of everything, rebound, rebound and run, offensive rebound. He can shoot from the outside. Apparently that changed since he was in Portland because in Portland, he wasn't shooting. He was turning down shots or he was missing shots. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually really close with Larry Nance Jr. who is with the Cavs. And, you know, we've talked about Josh Hart in the past and the Cavs had interest in Josh Hart at the trade deadline. They had interest in Josh Hart a couple of years ago. He's just the kind of guy who impacts winning in a positive way. So it's not surprising to me that him going there, filling in some of the gaps for the Knicks has really helped them reach the next level. And obviously Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle, really good one-two combination. So um, to me, looking at what they've been able to do since the trade deadline, when fully healthy, I think that's the big thing, when fully healthy. It's very, very impressive. And at one point, there were people in Cleveland now that were wondering, hey, are the Knicks going to run down the Cavs for the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference? That's the way that the Knicks were playing immediately after that trade. Yeah, and, and to your point, the Knicks have really taken another level after the Josh Hart trade. He just does everything that you came and see in the stat yeah. sheet sometimes, just from his defensive presence, the way right. he's able to just get into opponents' heads, You know, his rotation on and off ball. It, it, it's just fantastic. And with Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle, those guys are playing out of their minds this season. Jalen Brunson really taking another leap after leaving the uh, Dallas Mavericks last season. Julius Randle being able to revitalize himself after having a down season last year yeah. and, and really getting into it with the fans and so forth. So it's good when you see all the, those guys perform. Also, you got to talk about Emmanuel quickly. Quinton Grimes has had some spot minutes here and there. So the, the, the rise of the Knicks have just, has just been interesting because it's been all internal. You know, it's not Evan Fournier. Uh, didn't go really outside of Jalen Brunson and Isaiah Hartenstein, who was a, who was a Cav at one point. You know, he uh, was. the Knicks have really done a lot of internal soul searching, soul searching this season, and, and yeah. it's come to fruition. Um, but as you noted, you know, uh, the worry about the the Knicks facing the Cavs fighting for the four seed doesn't look like that's going to happen. The Cavs have also <laughs> been hot as of late. Yeah. But give us some details about the Cleveland Cavaliers this season. Yeah, but I think they're about where a lot of people expected them to be. You know, if you would have had a conversation about the Eastern Conference in general coming into the season, you probably would have started that conversation with Milwaukee and Boston and Philadelphia and then Brooklyn before Brooklyn decided that they were going to break up their roster, which was something that was always a possibility with those explosive personalities of Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. But those were the four teams that were viewed as the upper echelon teams in the Eastern Conference, probably on a different tier. They had been through more than the Cavs. They had seen more than the Cavs. They were together longer than the Cavs. They have more experience than the Cavs. That's the thing. When it comes to the Cavs, everybody believed that they had the talent, especially after going out and getting Donovan Mitchell. You know, they were one of two teams coming into the year, Al, that had three all-star players in their starting five. The only other team was the Golden State Warriors, the mm -hmm. reigning NBA champions. So the Cavs had the talent, and then Donovan Mitchell took them to a different level because he brought new hope. He brought new belief. And then you started to look at it and say, okay, but they're really, really young. Their average age in their starting five is 23.2 years old. 
So is that experience that they don't have, is that the thing that is going to separate them from Milwaukee, Boston, Philadelphia, Brooklyn? That was the conversation at the beginning of the year. And the Cavs, you know, to their credit throughout the course of the year, they learn through some of their failures. And that's what you have to do, right? This is a process. Even though Donovan Mitchell was brought here, even though the Cavs had the talent, they were seeing things and going through things for the first time as a team. They had to figure those things out as they went on. They had to learn from those. They had to grow from those. And they're a better team now at the end of the season because of some of their stumbles early on, because they needed time to figure that out. And their whole goal, Al, from the very beginning of the season was, we're going to try and be at our best, playing our best basketball, having the answers that we need going mm -hmm. into the postseason. It's not about having those answers in November, December, and January. It's about having those answers in March and April going into the playoffs. And they feel really, really good about where they are heading into the postseason. And I think they have every reason to feel good about it. Absolutely. Look, they're 48 and 29 in the season. I mean, it... I mean, we kind of got a glimpse that Brooklyn was maybe going to blow it all up right. past offseason, right? We just didn't know. Uh, for, to me, it was, also, it was still a little bit shocking because they were doing so well. And then mm. once the Kevin Durant injury happened, right. things just started to, to fall apart. And so this really opened up the door for the Cavs and the Knicks to take another step forward in the standings. But sticking with the Cavs for a bit, what is the expectation of this team right now? Because last year... You're talking about a play-in team, got some good experience facing the Brooklyn Nets. You know, that's ultimately who they lost to to right. get kicked out. But now you add Donovan Mitchell this offseason. What are you expecting from this team come playoffs? I think people have to be honest about it. If you were to ask the Cavs, they're going to say, we got a shot at this thing. We got a shot. Why don't we have a shot? We're top 10 mm -hmm. in offense and defense. We've got the number one defense in the NBA. We've got the number two net rating in the NBA. Like everything on our resume points to us being a legitimate title contender, right? If you just did blind resume and you didn't know who the players involved were, and you just looked at offensive rating, defensive rating, net rating, all those different numbers, the Cavs would be one of the best teams in the NBA because they have been one of the best teams in the NBA. But there are a couple of things. Number one, you know, they're not Milwaukee and they're not Boston. They haven't accomplished the same things together that those teams have. So you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. And the other thing that's working against the Cavs is that, the, to me, the two best teams in the entire NBA are Milwaukee and Boston, and they're both in the Eastern Conference. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a tougher road for the Cavs in the East than it would be most years. Um, the other thing is, you know, they only play – seven, eight, nine guys consistently. And the top seven are set. But once you get beyond the top seven, there's a lot of there's a lot of inconsistency and there's not a lot of clarity. Like some night it's going to be Jetty Osman. Another night it's going to be Lamar Stevens. Another night it might be Dean Wade. Then another night, who knows? It could be Howell Neto because they need pesky on the ball defense against opposing point guards. So there's just not a lot of stability after their top seven. And I would say there's not a whole lot of stability after their top four. Top four being Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, and Jared Allen. Um, so what's going to happen in a postseason series if Evan Mobley's in foul trouble or Jared Allen's in foul trouble or Darius Garland doesn't have it going? Whatever the case may be. You know, it just feels like it's one year early to start having expectations of a championship, start having expectations of beating Milwaukee, Boston, those kinds of teams in a seven game series. But the good thing for the Cavs is that their clock isn't ticking at the same rate that those other teams is ticking at. You know, all of their guys, their most important players are 26 years old or younger, and they're all under contract for at least three seasons. So that gives them a runway to see this thing through, that gives them an opportunity for a little bit more internal development and growth where they don't have to go up and blow up the roster because it's not working. They've learned that their roster, their core works together. It works together well to make them a contending team, but Boston and Milwaukee loom. You know, and 
it's totally true because when you when I watch the Cavs, it between and specifically with the top four, you talk about Garland, Mitchell, yep. uh, Mobley, Allen, like they all click. It it just yep. as soon as even when Donovan Mitchell started the season, it just seemed to fit seamlessly. Right, it seemed like everyone just knew their position. But you mentioned, you know, outside of consistency of the top four, you know, reliability through the top seven. I'm curious on your thoughts about Kevin Love and waving him because it seemed like a vet. Even though he was going through a bit of struggles, you think that he want your vet. He was a three point shooter. He's been there for such a long time. What happened with him, and why was he, you know, essentially kicked to the curb? One of those things that I said, Al, about the um, the names after the top seven. Like if if you're not named Garland, Mitchell, Okoro, Mobley, Allen, Lavert, Rubio, you didn't have a finite role. Well, let me rephrase. You had a finite role, but it was going to fluctuate game to game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some nights you might need the offensive spark of Jetty Osman. Other nights you might need the rugged defense of Lamar Stevens, somebody that the Cavs have gone to. Some nights you might need the size of Dean Wade, somebody that they've used both in the starting lineup and coming off the bench. And for somebody like Kevin Love, who has accomplished everything that he's accomplished throughout the course of his career, that is a very, very difficult role for him to be in. He's in Miami now. He knows when his shots are coming. He knows his place within the offense. He knows that he's in that starting lineup. He knows what to expect on a nightly basis. He didn't have any kind of clarity of when his number was going to call, when his shots were going to come, um, who he was going to be playing alongside in certain rotations. And I just think the Cavs looked at it and said, you know, For somebody like Kevin, we're a defensive first team. Can we get enough of what we need from eight slash nine guy to be able to work with Kevin in terms of a buyout situation and get him to a situation that is better for him and a situation that may be better for us? Because the other thing coming down the stretch of the season now, the Cavs wanted to see okay, is Dean Wade ready for a bigger role? He's young. He's never been there. Is he ready for a bigger role? Is Lamar Stevens ready for a bigger role? Is X player ready for a bigger role? We know what we have in Kevin. We know he's a veteran. He's been there, done that. But we're not going to be able to play him the kind of minutes that that he would want to play because we want to see if these other guys are ready for that kind of moment. We're, we want to see like how they're going to function alongside some of these other players that we have in this lineup. And I just think the Cavs felt like they would have been doing Kevin Love a disservice if they would have put him in that kind of um, situation. And when, once again, we are talking to Chris Fedor. He is the Cavs and NBA reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer. He's also a host at 92.3 The Fan. Chris, you know, I got another question for you um, regarding this team and mm-hmm. – it comes to J.B. Bickerstaff because this team has taken another level even prior to getting Donovan Mitchell, and it seems like J.B. has been that guy to really be the foundation to set this team in the right direction. Can you please give me some information on what, you thought, what your thoughts about him as the head coach? Al, I just think he was the right coach at the right time. Um, this was a team that was you know, going through a rebuild post-LeBron, They needed an identity. They needed an established culture. They needed all those things behind the scenes. You know what I mean? Before we even get into the X's and O's, the in-game management, um, the play calls after timeouts, the rotations and all that kind of stuff. They just needed somebody to do all of the groundwork stuff that you have to do in a rebuild. And he has done that. That is the best thing that I can say about JB is that when you think the Cleveland Cavaliers, you know who they are and what they want to be. They are a defense first team. They're going to be playing as hard as any team on a nightly basis. They're never going to give up. They're never going to think that they're out of a game. They're really, really scrappy. They're selfless. They sacrifice for each other. Like he has gotten them to believe and buy in to a goal um, that is bigger than themselves. And that's the best thing that I can say about JB. And that's what this group needed more so than some kind of like tactician or some kind of drill sergeant, his ability to communicate with these guys in a way that makes them want to follow 
is not something that should be overlooked because that's what a young team needs. They need that structure. They need that identity. They need to be rowing a boat in the same direction. And he's gotten them to do that. And he's gotten a young team with a whole bunch of different personalities to buy into the defensive end of the floor first in a league that is driven by offense. You know, how hard is that to do these days? Ask That's some other coaches around the NBA about that and how difficult that is. And the Cavs have found a way to do that. And, you know, you, you talk about players buying into defense first. That's Tom Thibodeau, too. You know, right. that's a guy who lives, breathes defense, although he he's trying to prove the doubters wrong that he does know some offense. <laughs> and shock, this Knicks team is in top 10 offense when you get offensive rating, which is yeah. crazy to even think about hearing with a Tom Thibodeau team. But you're absolutely right, Chris. When you think about instilling defense, especially into a young team, just like the Knicks as well. They're yeah. This is why I think this matchup is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about that next. This The Knicks are also a young team to instill some defense into them and then have the offense come later. It's very difficult to do and to watch this Knicks team just grow the same way as you're talking about for the Cavs and hear the similarities between him and J.B. Bickerstaff and just have a seasoned coach who understands how to connect mm -hmm. with players. Even though Tibbs, he's not the guy that will necessarily be the one connecting. He, yeah. he relies on someone like a Johnny Bryant in the past, a Kenny Payne, right. you know, um, a Mike Woodson. Those are the guys that help build up his weaknesses as a head coach. But seeing that type of foundation being laid, totally understand what you're talking about when it comes to J.B. Bickerstaff and the Cavs. Yeah. And you know what, Al? Like, I sat down with J.B. recently to talk about his coaching journey, and it has been a journey for him. You know, the stuff that happened in Memphis, the stuff that happened in Houston, and the circumstances – in which he actually got those jobs. And then he lost out to John Beeline in the Cavs coaching search. And then mm -hmm. he became the coach in waiting behind John Beeline. So it has been a journey. And I just said to him, I said, JB, like, what do you think defines you as a coach? And what do you think makes a successful coach in the NBA? And it's so funny because like, he didn't answer anything about strategy or X's and O's or play calls. It was all about managing personalities. And that's the thing. You are a teacher, obviously, if you're going to be a coach, but you're a manager of personalities. There are 17 dudes in an NBA locker room. They all come from different backgrounds. They all have different desires. They all have different roles. They all have different goals throughout the course of their career. You can't communicate with each one the same kind of way, right? How you talk to Darius Garland is different than how you talk to Jetty Osman. How you talk to Donovan Mitchell is going to be different than how you talk to Ricky Rubio. So finding a way to manage personalities, that is so much about what a head coach is in today's NBA. Because how many teams around the NBA have talent? Like a ton of them have talent. Of course. Like how many coaches can draw up good plays? You have to be able to do all that kinds of stuff. But like, can you get guys to buy into a bigger purpose when you have so many different egos in play? when you have so many different motivations in play and for the Cavs, like think about Kevin Love, think about Ricky mm -hmm. Rubio before Kevin was bought out. This is a future hall of famer, somebody who is a franchise legend, an NBA champion. You can go through the resume and he was willing to come off the bench in a six man role last year for the greater good of the team. And he finished second in six man of the year voting behind Tyler Hero. Like, mm -hmm. That is a level of sacrifice that because of the relationship that JB built with Kevin Love, Kevin was able to step into that lesser role and thrive in it with a different coach. I don't know that it goes as well as it did. And Ricky Rubio could start on a lot of teams as the point guard, but because Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell are occupying the backcourt, Ricky Rubio is willing to sacrifice. He's willing to be selfless. He was willing to re-sign here this offseason in that kind of role, in part because of his relationship with J.B. Bickerstaff and this organization. J.B. has done all of that behind the scenes. And now the Cavs have that already set in place, and they don't have to worry about that stuff anymore as long as he's here. And that just goes to, like, names. That makes me think about Steve Kerr. You know, it makes right. me think about Greg Popovich. Um, Knicks fans are going to hate this name, but Phil Jackson even, you know, when you watch the Last Dance documentary. Uh so Eric's true Wolstra, when it comes to think about getting all those guys to buy in in Miami. Yeah. Like he had the talent. There's no doubt about it. And Absolutely. when you have the talent, it becomes easier. 
but you have to get those guys going in the same direction, right? You have to find a way to manage those personalities and make it work. Absolutely. 100%. But Chris, there's, there's something that I know everyone's tuning in and they want to hear for before we break down this, this game, before we get into this game preview, Knicks Cavs seem to be on a collision course right now. Well, Cavs are fourth right now in, in the Eastern conference. The Knicks are right behind. What are the vibes over in Cleveland right now from amongst the fan base? You know, we, we, I, I think, uh, through Twitter, there was words that some of the some people in the front office of the Cavs front office don't necessarily want to see the Knicks in the first round. What is the pulse over in Cleveland right now, potentially facing the Knicks first round of the playoffs? Yeah, so that whole thing was my report, actually. Oh, um, look at that. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Multiple members of the organization were privately hoping for a first round matchup against Brooklyn. Like, no duh. <laughs> Who in the NBA? would not want to see Brooklyn in a first round playoff series, this version of Brooklyn, right? Because Brooklyn would be the easiest layup for anybody in the first round, whether it's the Western conference or the Eastern conference, because the team that they have right now is not why they're in the playoff mix. 32 of their wins on the season L came because of guys who are no longer playing for them. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and Ben Simmons, who is out for the year. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yep. So, like, everybody would want to or should want to play Brooklyn in round one. So when I was asked the question by a reader for my mailbag, Hey, Chris, like, who would be the most favorable matchup for the Cavs in the first round? And I started it by saying multiple members of the organization feel the same way, that they would want Brooklyn, and privately they've been hoping for Brooklyn. That didn't mean that the Cavs were – scared of the Knicks or scared of the Miami Heat. But it's like, if you're a team like the Cavs that is in the postseason for the first time since 2018 and in the postseason for the first time without LeBron James since 1998, 25 years, wouldn't you want the easiest path to get out of the first round? Yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't you want the easiest path to get as much postseason experience as possible and get as many games in a postseason as possible? So if you had the choice between New York, Miami, and Brooklyn, this version of Brooklyn, who are you going to take? Like, Do you want to see Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo and Tyler Hero and Eric Spolstra, one of the best coaches in the NBA, in round one? For all the things that the Cavs have accomplished this year and as good as they have shown themselves to be, that would be a daunting seven-game series against Miami. They've been there, done that. They know how to turn it on in the playoffs. Jimmy Butler in a playoff series? We've seen playoff Jimmy. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people would want to see that in a seven game series, despite the fact that Miami has struggled this year. And you can say the same thing about the Knicks, like given the way that they have played when healthy since trading for Josh Hart, that in a seven game series is a little bit more of a toss up. I think the Cavs would be favored if they had home court advantage. I would pick the Cavs to win that series over the Knicks, but I think that would test them. I think that would be a very, very difficult series for the Cavs. It certainly wouldn't be the gimme that Brooklyn would be. So in a seven-game series against the Knicks, I think it would be a battle. I think it would be a lot of fun. I think it would be entertaining, very, very competitive. And mm -hmm. I would give the edge to the Cavs simply because home court advantage. The Cavs have been um, way different at home than on the road. They have one of the best home court advantages in the NBA and winning at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse four times in seven tries against these Cavs is going to be very difficult for anybody. Now, you know, this is Knicks fan TV, so obviously yeah. I, I am a Knicks fan. Of uh, course. I'm going to push back and say, you know, as much as I understand the talent that Cleveland has, Knicks are a good road team. You know, they're 22-16 and 16 on the season, one of the better road teams in the NBA. Um a like challenge. I feel like it's a little bit, there's a little bit less pressure for them than playing at Madison Square Garden because one, Knicks fans, we can just be, we can be lively, we can just be loud, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes that may be a little bit intimidating to, to our own players, it seems like. Yeah. But plus we're playing at MSG too. And <laughs> they just have to show up for those type of matchups. And I can only imagine Donovan Mitchell coming through. Yeah. But that's why I will put the I'll give the edge for the Knicks playing on the road. They're going to be a difficult matchup just because when, as you keep saying, when healthy, when Brunson's healthy, you know, right. he's dealing with uh, with a wrist injury right now. 
Julius Randle just, uh, he sprained his ankle. We're still waiting to get more details on that. Maybe it's dropped as we're doing this recording. But if they're healthy, we're talking about two really good isolation scores. They're tough to guard. They both command the double and triple team. I think it'll be a solid matchup uh, going into this postseason. I do not look at, at, I do not look at this as a gimme for either team. I expect this to go seven series uh, just because I think it will be a bloodbath. You know, as a Knicks fan, the only thing I'm concerned about is the Twin Towers. Right. Uh, ma- mainly just for defensive purposes and, yeah. and, you know, for the Knicks outside of Randall and, and having Mitch, you know, we're a little bit on the smaller side, on the smaller yeah. side when it comes to the perimeter. So that's where I would look at this matchup being a toss up for the team. Yeah. I mean, I think the Cavs are set up the way that they're constructed defensively. Um, I think they are set up to handle the Knicks because of the Knicks style offensively. Like if you switch Evan Mobley onto Jalen Brunson in an isolation situation, that's very, very different for Jalen Brunson than what he would see against most teams. You know what I mean? That Mm -hmm. is an elite defensive player, the year type that can handle that kind of matchup with his unique ability um, to defend on the perimeter, just like he can defend at the rim. And so much of what the Knicks do is isocentric. They don't pass a whole ton. You know what I mean? Yep. So the Cavs have premier individual isolation defenders. Mobley against Randall is a matchup I think Evan can handle. Like Julius has been great this year. He deserves all of the credit that he's been given. Um, any individual accolades that he gets at the end of the season are going to be warranted. But Evan Mobley is the second best isolation defender among bigs in the entire NBA behind Nick Claxton. So that's a matchup that the Cavs would feel okay with. Isaac Okoro in the matchups against Jalen Brunson has given him problems with his strength, with his peskiness. Um, The numbers for Brunson in that matchup against Okoro have not been favorable for Brunson. So I just think stylistically, because the Cavs have defenders like Jared Allen, like Evan Mobley, like Isaac Okoro. And Darius Garland is limited defensively because of his size and because he's not the strongest guy, but he is a pesky defender in his own right. I just Mm -hmm. think there are matchups that the Cavs can handle in that kind of series based on how the Knicks attack. Like if they were to attack a different kind of way, then maybe it would be different. But I think the isolation that the Knicks run and they go ISO heavy, I think that plays into the Cavs having the kind of defense that they do. We'll see. You know, we'll see what happens once that time comes. Um, I'm still confident in my in my Knicks, Chris. So you even, even, even though even though what you said, you I be. totally understand. I'm still <laughs> confident in my Knicks. It's just how I'm going to be rolling the season. Uh, on this show, I've been known as the guy that jumps out the window. So I'll drop usually have a background behind me. I'm jumping out the window because I'm just <laughs> that excited. That's 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 who I am on this show. But you know what, Chris? We can't look too far ahead for the playoffs because there's still five games left for the Knicks, at least, that got to be played before we finally get to see what how, what the matches will be. Yep. So let's get into this game. Let's get into this game preview. And the matchup that I'm looking at from the get-go is none other than Jalen Brunson versus Donovan Mitchell. Because you're talking about, one, these guys faced each other in the playoffs last year, Dallas versus Utah. They both were in the Western Conference. Now they're both in the Eastern Conference. Both of them are having phenomenal seasons. Uh, Jalen Brunson snubbed the being an all-star, you know, just because of his performance and how he's lifted this New York Knicks team. The way he's able to attack in isolation, as we've talked about, his playmaking, facilitating, uh, the, the way he sacrifices his body to take charges. He's just been a leader that this team is mm-hmm. surely needed after last season, and I just love everything about it. And, you know, on the other side, you got Donovan Mitchell, a guy who's having just a stellar season, probably one of his best seasons that he has in his NBA career. He's averaging 27.6 points per game. You know, he's shooting 47.6% from the field. He's shooting 38% from downtown on nine attempts per game. He's just been unstoppable, man, especially with the assists, the 4.5 assists, averaging four total rebounds. I think this is going to be a good matchup to watch. Uh, They won't necessarily be guarding each other, but I think it will be... To me, it's going to be like watching a good two good football teams, right? Like the Peyton Manning, Tom Brady battles back in the day. That's how I'm looking at this as as two guys who are going to be directing the offense. What do you think about this matchup? And there's something about Donovan that he has brought to the Cavs that is unquantifiable. It's just a winning element. 
everywhere that he has gone, he has won five straight years in the postseason in Utah. And now he's going to a sixth straight postseason with the Cavs. There's just a belief in the locker room of we can because that guy is on our side. Like we're never out of a game because of that guy. Even the fourth quarter of the other night against the Atlanta Hawks, the Cavs went into that fourth quarter. They're down double digits. And Donovan just like goes on a flurry. He just has a way to get guys to believe and come along with him. And he makes it easier on Darius Garland, right? He makes it easier on Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. And if you think back to last year, Al, when it came to the Cavs going into the play-in tournament against Brooklyn and Atlanta, like part of why the Cavs came up short is because they were putting so much on Darius. Colin Sexton was out for the year. Ricky Rubio was hurt, then traded. Karis LeVert was still trying to find his place, and he was playing through injury. So, so much of the offense was predicated on Darius, Darius, Darius. He had all Mm -hmm. the eyes of the opposing defense on him. And if you think about Donovan Mitchell, if you go back to that playoff series against Dallas, they were able to do things defensively against him that teams can't do against a Donovan Mitchell team because he's now playing alongside Darius. So when you have two guys that are used to being the focal point of the opposing defense, the top name on the scouting report, all eyes on them, like you can't function the same way defensively when they're out there on the court together. Darius makes Donovan better. Donovan makes Darius better. And I think that's a big reason why you see from an efficiency standpoint, Darius and Donovan being at their best together. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's, it's a dynamic duo as a backcourt, but it's interesting considering with when Donovan was rumored to the, the Knicks, it was like, Oh, well, if you have Brunson and Mitchell, that's a small backcourt. And this is a small backcourt, but the difference is Evan Mobley and Jared Allen. And how do they fit into this offense for, for the Cleveland Cavaliers? Well, the Cavs are as pick and roll heavy as any team in the NBA. Um, and and when you have a screen setter like Jarrett and you have a screen setter like Evan and they provide vertical spacing and such a lob threat, um, it just creates space for Darius and Donovan. Um, and Evan has grown as an offensive player as the season has progressed. He's more comfortable attacking mismatches. He's more comfortable attacking switches. He's more comfortable in the post. He can get to his left-handed hook, his right-handed hook. He's got this fadeaway that he's been working on as well. And for all the things that that you can say that Evan Mobley doesn't have at this stage of his career as a 21-year-old kid, like the strength, the physicality, the three-point shot, he um, impacts every single possession, both offensively and defensively, just with his sheer presence. And I think... When you talk about Jarrett and Evan, they're not guys, well, Jarrett specifically, they're not going to have a lot of plays called for them, right? They're not going to have consistent touches to the same level as Darius and Donovan. The offense is going to run through Darius and Donovan, but they are just as important to the offensive success because of the other little things that they bring to the table and the way that they can make things easier on Darius and Donovan and the way that the Cavs operate with pick and roll heavy Someone's got to set those screens, right? Somebody's got to roll to the basket. Somebody's got to pop out to the three-point line. And Evan and Darius um, have worked a great two-man game when Evan's been playing for Jared Allen. And Jared Allen and Donovan Mitchell have a great two-man game. Like, if you look at the numbers just in terms of frequency and in terms of efficiency, like the Cavs bigs with those two guys, it's as good as it gets in the NBA. Now, I got a question for you about this offense because, you know, I look at the offensive rating, mm-hmm. the Cavs are ranked eighth. But when I look at the points, <laughs> they're ranked 24th. It, it's, right. it's not adding up. So is it the defense that's leading to a lot of offense? Because you look at the defense, they're first in defensive rating, and then you look at the rating, they're, they're second. Yeah. So I'm guessing that there's some defensive prowess that's cha- that's channeling into offense too. Is that is that right? Yeah, there's part of it. Um, the other big part of it is that they play at the second slowest pace in the entire NBA mm. by design. They do that because they have the kind of defense that they can lean on, right? 
And they do that because they feel like Darius and Donovan, even if the shot clock starts ticking down, if they get into an isolation situation, a one-on-one situation, that those guys are so good that they can create something out of nothing. So the Cavs run at times, but they're not a team that wants to play up-tempo, get a whole bunch of possessions like Sacramento Kings, Golden State Warriors style. This is a team that is built on the strength of its defense and the best way um, to allow your defense to be what it is, is to slow down the game, um, minimize the number of possessions, allow that defense to get set and kind of like grind games in an old school 1980s, 1990s Mm. style way. This is making quite the matchup that's going to, man, I really need the Knicks and the Cavs to be facing each other. This is going to be the slowest paced game we'll ever watch in the playoffs. It's like the Spider-Man meme on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. It'll be, uh, we're going to have some people's eyes bleeding. We might be getting scores if this happens like in the 80s, 90s, the, the way that these the, 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 we're talking about pace right now. I mean, look but, at the three games that they've played and look at the yeah. final scores in those three games. Yeah, they've been very low scoring games, was it? You had, uh, let's see, you had one, well, you had 10, 103, 105 Knicks won the last yep. one. It was 92, 81, which was yep. good work. And then you also had uh, 121 to 108, but then it was that that was a Donovan Mitchell, Kevin Love. That's why I yep. asked about Kevin Love because they both were just shooting the lights out from behind right. the arc. They both had like seven, eight threes. I was like, "What is? We're just not going to guard the three point line? This is crazy." <laughs> it, it, it was that that was bothering me that day. I right. I was irate. That is but once the again, <laughs> but once again, we're talking with Chris Friedor. He is the captain and NBA reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer. He's also a host at 92.3 The Fan. All right, Chris. We're, we're close to wrapping this thing up. Let's get into battle of the benches, you know, over the last five games. Must we? What was, what was that? I said, must we? The Cavs have <laughs> yes. one of the worst yes, benches must, in the entire league. <laughs> yes, we, we must get into the battle of the benches, Chris. We yeah. must get into battle of the benches. Um, Over the last five games, uh, the Knicks, for the Knicks, we've been starting to bounce back slowly but surely, which is – been good because the Knicks bench to begin the season was brutal. Uh, I must be honest. It was brutal to watch. And, and it was it was mostly because like Derrick Rose was the same Derrick Rose. We didn't have Josh Hart. So you're trying to figure out where you get offense from outside of Manuel quickly. Um, the misutilization of uh of Obi Toppin is constantly just confusing. And then Isaiah Hartenstein was not playing at the level he is now. So we didn't get to really see the same passing that we wanted to see. So it was it was a bit of back and forth. So it was nothing nothing to write home about, as I, yeah. uh, as we would say around here. But, you know, it won't look great on the stat. The Knicks are still for their bench, still ranked 25th in the NBA. And not too far behind is the Cleveland Cavaliers with 20, being 28th. And this is for points uh, per game coming off the bench. So for the Knicks, it's it's been different, one, as you've noted, with Josh Hart. He just adds a lot of things between him and quickly. You know, offense is now taking a spike up. We're now starting to see Isaiah Hartenstein pass the ball really well again, especially from the high post. Really liking some of that. Obi is seeming to find his his jumper from three, so it's been helpful. Um, Nick's bench is doing well. What do you think about uh, your Cavs bench? <laughs> you know how Charles Barkley used to say, if you're a LeBron James, you can't have everything? <laughs> yes. Right? Like you didn't get the hairline for a reason because you're great at everything else and no one person should have everything. When it comes to the Cavs, you can't have everything, right? You Mm. can't have a great starting five and a great bench unless you're like the dynastic Golden State Warriors. And I don't think anybody in the NBA thinks that team exists right now. So the weak point of the Cavs, obviously, is their bench. The other weak point of the Cavs is their starting small forward spot. It's been that way since the beginning of the season. It's been that way since LeBron left in 2018. And nothing has changed as this season has gone on. The Cavs didn't make a significant move at the trade deadline. They didn't make a significant addition to the team after that. Danny Green was brought in on a buyout, but he's only played in blowout situations. He's still working his way back from the knee injury. And I just don't know that he has a consistent place in this tight eight, nine man rotation. So Mm -hmm. the same weakness that the Cavs had coming into the year with their bench still exists. It's just the way that it is. Uh, Karis LeVert is an erratic player by nature. Uh, Jetty Osman is an erratic player by nature. 
Ricky Rubio is still working his way back following um, surgery on a torn ACL. And if you talk to anybody that's had that injury, it's not year one where that guy gets it back. It's year two. So I think the Cavs had realistic expectations about the kind of impact that Ricky Rubio was going to have from a production standpoint. He's still getting it together. This version of Ricky Rubio that the Cavs have gotten is not nearly as impactful as the guy that he was at the beginning of the season when he was a fixture of their rotation when he was getting some six man of the year buzz it's just the reality of the situation that the Cavs are in and if you think about it though from a big picture standpoint if you get into a playoff series if you're playing seven games and you have a day off in between and things along those lines the Cavs might have four of the top eight leaders in minutes played in the first Mm. round playoff series because they're just going to ask a ton of Evan Mobley and Jared Allen and Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland, because the way that they're currently constructed with a thin erratic bench, that's their best formula for success in a seven game series. There's a reason why there are only two worst benches in the NBA. One of them's Miami. Now that heroes in the starting lineup. And the other one is the Portland trailblazers. Like that's not the company that you want to keep. But there's also a reason why the Cavs have one of the most productive starting fives in the entire NBA. So again, you can't have everything. No, and that makes sense. But what's funny is that when you look at the, like when you go to the advanced stats and I'm looking for the offensive rating, like the Knicks bench unit over the last five games, they're ninth, Cavs are 11th. So you see that they're they're up there and they're starting to gel. Obviously the Cavs yeah. defense goes straight to the bench as well. They're six with the Knicks being uh, 20th right now. It's all about Karis LeVert, Al. You know, when it comes to Karis LeVert, if you get good Karis, and March has been one of the best months in his entire career. It's Mm -hmm. been easily his best month of this entire season. If you get good, impactful, productive Karis at both ends of the floor, that takes the Cavs bench to a different kind of level. He's the swing guy for that bench. He's the X factor. He's the guy who plays starter-like minutes coming off the bench. And if he's going to be good and he's going to be productive, that changes the dynamic for the Cavs. That doesn't put as much on Jetty Osman, right? That doesn't put as much on Ricky Rubio. That doesn't put as much even on Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. So it's all about Karras. And when he's good coming off the bench, the Cavs are usually pretty good coming off the bench. And and you talk about Karras for the for the Cavs. For us, it's Emmanuel quickly, who's as of right now a favorite for six man of the year. And boy, has he taken a leap! I wrote an article for KnicksFanTV.com saying he's the third most impactful player on this team, third most crucial player, and his play this season has just been dynamo. The way he's been a two way player offensively, he's become more consistent from inside the perimeter by making mid range shots. He's more selective with his floaters because when he was a rookie, it was like I'm going to take floaters and threes. And the only fours and threes. Now he can finish through contact for waves. Now he can make turnaround jumpers. He's got the footwork slightly learning from uh, Jalen Brunson and fin- finishing up and unders. You know, he's averaging 14 points this season. He's got four rebounds, averaging 3.3 assists. And when you need to play a start at starter minutes, he's been averaging over 19 points every time he gets called up. So he's been phenomenal for us and for the Cavs. You're going to have to figure out how to stop, slow him down because He's the guy that's been taking charge. And even last night against the Miami Heat in a crucial game, Jalen Brunson didn't finish the fourth quarter. It was Emmanuel quickly and for his show to run. So quickly has just been dynamic this season. I have a question for you as an NBA voter about quickly. And it's something that I've been kicking around in my own head. Sure. Would you say that that quickly's best games, most productive games, most impactful games have come when he's filled in for Jalen Brunson as a starter? Um. Yes and no. Um, okay. And it's it's because, yes, even when, with RJ out, when Brunson was back against Phoenix, he stepped up. When Jalen was out during against the Celtics, he stepped up. Um, he had some games when Jalen was out where he was just not playing a game. But okay. coming off, the, but being a bench player for most of the season, you know, for a long time, he didn't average under double digits, anything under double digits for like, I, mm. like, I think it was like 30 some odd games. He only dealt, it was like a handful of times that happened. Um, now, that being said, like his impact truly is a difference maker coming off that bench. And yeah. his defense is re- really has transcended him to a whole other level because yeah. he's been closing games as of late. 
even after Josh Hart. It's mm -hmm. been Brunson for the most part, quickly Hart, Julius Randle, and Mitchell Robinson. And yeah. so uh, for what he does, like I look at Malcolm Brogdon as being a luxury for the Celtics because yeah. you got Tatum and Brown who are just, they're, they're box office. You know what I mean? Like you can rely on one right. of those guys any single night. Uh, Al Horford's awesome for that team as well. They got a lot of good players. For quickly, if the Knicks didn't have quickly at the beginning of the season, mm -hmm. as it, as great as Brunson and Randall have been, I think you're still losing some games just because without him, that bench is just downright. Yeah. Wo like, woolly. I, I, yeah. It, it's awful. So, yeah. Because I've just been wondering for myself, like, how much of his production has been boosted by the fact that he took advantage of starting opportunities when Brunson was out or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And like, is it fair to give him the recognition for six man of the year? If many of his best performances, many of his best games came as a starter, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, no. that's the thing that I struggle with as a voter. Totally understand that. And I've looked at like, you know, I was going through stats about this and I'm trying to pull it up right now. And I had the, had a conversation on post game last night after the heat, um, after the after the Knicks defeated the Heat, and here it is right here. You know when Jamal Crawford uh, won, he played. He started twenty four out of sixty nine games one mm -hmm. season. That was thirteen fourteen. Will Williams started nineteen out of seventy nine games and won as well. Lamar Odom when he won, he started thirty five out of eighty two. And I think for me, like it's not just your impact off the bench, but you're the sixth guy. Like if someone's out, you got to be able to step up and still produce. And that that would be my counter argument. Yeah, saying, I get that. Yeah, so. Like Brogdon, he's come off the bench the entire season, but yeah. the fact that for quickly, like we've also won games mm. when Brunson hasn't been able to play. Right. I think that's been big just to keep this thing afloat. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, that's by nature, that's what a sixth man is. Mm. Like if somebody is out for, for the Cavs, for example, like if Donovan or Darius is out, then Karis LeVert steps up and he can fill starter quality minutes and stuff like that. That's, that's part of your responsibility as a six man. So I think that's a fair way to look at it. Um, awesome. Well, now that I know that you're a voter, Chris, you know, uh, if, if you could just, do, if you could just do us a favor, if you get no, just going to spam uh, my inbox, right. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do us a favor, you know I mean? Oh uh, man, but let's wrap, the, let's wrap this show up, Chris, really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah. what, let's get some score predictions, man. What do you think the final score of this game tomorrow will be between the Knicks and the Cavs. Oh, good Lord. I mean, the Cavs are going to have a skeleton crew, probably. Isaac Okoro is already out. Jared Allen is doubtful for the game. Um, Danny Green's not going to be available. Their, their Cleveland Charge G League guys aren't going to be available. They might have 10 guys, 10, mm. maybe 11, something like that. Um, but, but it's interesting because, as we've talked about, they're different at home than on the road. And the Cavs believe, right or wrong, the Cavs believe that three is available. Like the third seed is still just hanging oh, there. Wow. If they can go on a run and put some pressure on Philly, given the fact that Philly has Miami still to play and Milwaukee and Boston, like if the Cavs run the table, that's a big if they drop games that they shouldn't drop every now and then. Um, and they might, you know, be cautious when it comes to some of these injuries, these nagging injuries down the stretch so that they can be at their best going into the postseason but if the Cavs run the table now I mean you're talking about then Philly would have to <laughs> they'd have to really only lose two games the rest of the way basically so the Cavs want the third seed um they believe that it's attainable and I think they're looking at that Knicks matchup as not just a playoff preview but as a stepping stone potentially to them getting the third seed in the mm. Eastern Conference. Because if you look at the way that their schedule sets up, like this is the last difficult game in front of them. After this, Indiana, Orlando, Charlotte. They could easily win those games, run the table. So if they beat the Knicks, and if they take it as seriously as they're talking about taking it, then, you know, I think it's going to be really, really interesting down the stretch between the Cavs and Philly for the third seed. So tomorrow night, even though the Cavs are probably going to be down Jared Allen, down Isaac Okoro, um, being at home, knowing the importance of the game, knowing that Julius Randle may not play for the Knicks, um, I do think that the Cavs will win tomorrow night. And I well, think the two teams will split the season series. 
But what's the score, Chris? We need to know the numbers. <laughs> oh, low scoring. Come on now. You know that, Al. Two of the first three have been low scoring. And I can't see these two teams, given what they're going to have available, I can't see these two teams engaging in a shootout. So I'll say something between the 105-110. We'll go Cavs 110, Knicks 104. How about that? Okay, okay. I'm going to go a little bit lower scoring than that just because, as you mentioned, Julius Randle, he was grimacing as he walked off the court yesterday. I do not expect him to be back tomorrow. Jalen Brunson is still trying to shake off the rust on his wrist. Yeah. Um, We're going to need another performance, solid performance from Emmanuel quickly and Quentin Grimes. So I'm going to take the Knicks uh, to win this one because fifth seed is also in play for them. They, they need to lock it up. They can't give any leeway to anybody else, especially the Brooklyn Nets behind them or, or, and so forth. So I think they're going to go in there, play with some urgency, knowing that Randall's down just so that they can also give Tibbs the ease at mind that they can rest him towards the <laughs> for the remainder of the season if they can, if they choose to do that. So I'm going to go 101 Knicks, 98 Cavs. We're going low scoring. We're going low scoring tomorrow. Throw back to the 80s and 90s. Just exactly. the way the Cavs like it. <laughs> exactly. With two of the slowest moving teams possible. <laughs> That's where we're going. But Chris, appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for previewing this game. Yep. Please let our listeners know where they can find your work and if you got anything coming up. Yeah, you can check out all my stuff, cleveland.com slash Cavs. That's the easiest way to get to the website. And then my stuff is always posted on Twitter as well. It's just my name, nice and easy. Chris and the last name spelled F-E-D-O-R. All one thing together, nice and easy. Don't try and do anything fancy. Um, and then coming up, you know, I've got a big sit down with JB Bickerstaff. Um, him and I talk about his coaching journey. I've got a big story on the brotherly bond between Darius and Donovan and why it's worked together so well. And then obviously with tomorrow night being such a big game between the Cavs and the Knicks, seeing it as a playoff preview, we're going to start looking at like how these teams match up if they were to face off in a seven game series. I think it would be fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm going to be, I'm definitely going to be on the lookout for that and checking into some of that as well. Chris, thank you once again for coming through and to Knicks Nation, salute to, to all of you for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. We'll catch you tomorrow night for Knicks Post Game Live and JD doing the play by play. All right, everyone, we out of here.